Good morning, everybody. It's um, great to be here. It's been a great conference um, the last couple of days. Uh, I managed to sit in several sessions and I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about things that I didn't know. Um, I also learned a lot about things that I thought were obvious but don't seem to be obvious to everybody else. And, and I learned a lot about the fact that um, we still have major disciplinary battles going on in this agriculture and nutrition sector. And I think it's a big challenge for us as we look ahead to figure out how to create much better convergence across all of us. Um, I'm going to focus a lot of my remarks this morning on policies, um, agriculture policies, and more generally, a policy environment for making agriculture and nutrition work. Um, starting with trying to figure out what's the best pathway between agriculture and nutrition improvement. There's been a lot of discussion around pathways over the last couple of days, and everybody has their own favorite. Here is the agriculture to nutrition pathway diagram. So I thought I'd start with my own uh, one, not just my own, it's a, uh, a pathway between agriculture and nutrition that we worked on when I was at the Gates Foundation, and the Gates Foundation continues to use it. And it's it's a fairly simplistic, uh, not simplistic, simple pathway, going from the way in which agriculture promotes productivity growth to improvements in household income, to improved food access, individual food intake, and which finally translates to individual nutrition improvement. Of course, there are various breaks along this pathway. There are breaks around the policy environment that makes agriculture productive, that gives incentives for farmers to invest in productivity improvement, uh, investments for markets to develop, and invest in uh, incentives for farmers to diversify their production systems, et cetera. There are breaks along the pathway, primarily also in terms of the institutional environment, uh, the role of women, gender empowerment, etc. And certainly the importance of water, sanitation, and hygiene conditions in translating uh, improved food intake to improved nutrition uh, for individuals, primarily when you think about children, children under two years of age, etc. One can argue that this kind of a linear pathway um, is a very simple representation and of course, there are much more complicated representations of the same pathway. And here is an example of a more complicated representation that I've been using more recently in my new job uh, at Cornell. And, the advantage, and this is coming up on our website tomorrow, so you'll get a better um, opportunity lo to look at it much more closely. The advantage of a much more complex representation of the pathway is that it allows you to look at all of the possible relationships and whenever people say, oh, you missed this or you missed that, you have an opportunity to figure out how to fit that in. But also, I think a crucial advantage of um, this representation is it starts with the individual first, individual nutrition, and then works up from the individual out to all of the relationships that are necessary for the individual's nutrition to, uh, improvement to take place. So that's the overall uh, representation on, on agriculture to nutrition pathways that I wanted to present to you. But the point I want to make is for agriculture productivity to take place to result in the adequate quantities of food, adequate supplies of food, stable supplies of food, adequate diversity of food, <coughs> food that has both calorie as well as high levels of micronutrient content in terms of the diversity that's provided. 
adequate representation of market forces in bringing that food from the agriculture sector to the consumer's plate and requires a policy environment that gives incentives for all of the players along this pathway to work. And quite often, it's the breakdown in policies, the break breakdown in the policy environment that prevents this pathway from working. And that's what I'd like to spend most of my time talking about. So let's talk about agriculture and food supply policies as they are today. As you think about where we are in, in developing country agriculture policies, I think it's quite clear that there is a strong persistence of Green Revolution focus on stable crop production. And that persistence of the, the Green Revolution focus is very, very clear whether you look at uh, South Asia or you look at Sub-Saharan Africa or even if you look at East Asia. And I'm not one of those people who thinks the Green Revolution was bad. In fact, I'm a very strong proponent of the Green Revolution. And, uh, and the, the way I ad address the issue is, just imagine if the Green Revolution hadn't taken place. Imagine what the world would have looked like. Imagine the enormous gains that we've made in hunger reduction, the poverty reduction, and how those gains would not have happened if you did not have the tremendous impact of the Green Revolution. So I'm a very strong proponent of the Green Revolution, but I also believe it's time for government policy to think beyond the Green Revolution, to think about an agriculture policy environment that enables not just the production of staple grains, but enables the production of a broad diversity of food groups that are necessary for improved nutrition at all levels. And I think as you think about that, we need to think about where those interventions need to come from. I think one of the primary areas where we lost out during the Green Revolution was the emphasis, the lack of emphasis on coarse grains, on lentils, on legumes, etc. And, and you've seen this, uh, Lawrence mentioned chickpeas, pigeon pea, etc. Lentil, lentil production in India dropped dramatically uh, after the Green Revolution. Uh, legume production dropped dramatically. And I think um, coarse grains such as sorghum, millets, traditional millets, etc., dropped dramatically. And one needs to figure out what's the mechanisms for bringing uh, these crops back into the farming systems. Um, what are the incentive and in, uh, systems that can promote better production of these crops? What's the market systems that will build the value chains for the coarse grains, the traditional millets, etc.? And that's an, that's an area that's really not been given enough focus in government policy. Uh, nutritionists talk about the importance of bringing coarse grains and uh, legumes and lentils back into the diets, uh, but there is a break between that understanding and what needs to be done from agriculture side to make that happen. Second, if you look at price trends um, over the past several decades, we've seen the real price of staple grains drop dramatically, uh, rice, wheat, maize, etc. Um, except for the most recent periods, uh, starting in 2007. Um, up until 2007, you have had a steady long-term decline in real prices of staple food. And that's had an enormous impact on hunger, an enormous impact on poverty reduction. But at the same time, if you look at the relative price of micronutrient-rich food, uh, fruit, fruits, vegetables, dairy product, livestock products, etc. The relative uh, prices of the non-staple foods has gone up over time. And we keep talking about diversification of diets, 
But as long as the relative price of non-staples is high and continues to rise relative to staples, then the opportunities for the poor to diversify their diet, diets are quite limited. And one needs to figure out what are the mechanisms that will reduce the relative price of non-staples to staple foods. And I think the primary mechanism that will make that happen is improving the supply responsiveness of non-staple production, improving the supply responsiveness of vegetable, livestock products, dairy products, etc. And that will only happen if there's massive investments in improving market infrastructure. Massive investments in cold storage, massive investments in improving rural wet markets, massive improvements in improving wholesale markets, etc. And yes, encouraging private sector to invest in market development. Some of the discussion I've heard around the rooms has been quite negative about the role of the private sector. But I don't believe you're ever going to get to adequate long-term supply of non-staple food in rural or in urban markets if the private sector in investment is not there. And I think this is an area where the agriculture, nutrition, and public health community needs to come to a convergence in understanding. Without the private sector, the ability to diversify the diets of the poor will be extremely limited. I wanted to say that. Now, one of, one of the lessons that we learned during the Green Revolution was that much of the productivity growth took place through intensification of agriculture, through increasing uh, yields per hectare of land cultivated. But the intensification of agriculture took place around particular crops, took place around rice, wheat, and maize. But can we see a process of intensification which is crop neutral? Can we think about a way in which you promote future intensification of agriculture, let's say in sub-Saharan Africa, where you create all of the, the necessary conditions for farmers to improve their productivity, but leave the choice of what crop farmers invest in to the farmer herself. And then the choice could be determined by market signals that are there, rather than having the choice of crop being determined by a minimum price policy or a support policy which promotes production of one crop relative to the other. I don't believe that the agriculture community has an answer to this. I don't believe the agriculture community can actually come out and tell you how you can create a neutral process of intensification which then allows the crop choice to be determined through a market. I mean, that's what happens in most developed country agriculture systems. But when you look at developing country systems, they're very much still driven, the crop choice is driven by government policy. Let me now talk for a few minutes about food-based food interventions. I think there's significant opportunities for biofortification uh, as one additional tool in improving micronutrient access. Uh, in the case of India today, you have the opportunity of having a biofortified pearl millet available in the market. Um, I spent a couple of days with a company called Nirmal Seeds in India, which is starting to promote biofortified pearl millet. And here's an opportunity, here's a good example of the impact that biofortified food can have uh, in terms of improving access to micronutrients for the poor and also looking at what impact it has on the nutritional status of the household, the women in the household, the children in the household. And I think this is one area where there are 
there are important opportunities for case studies and important opportunities for then translating that experience to looking at other biofortified food that's coming onto the market or that's in the pipeline. Second, um, as we think about access to food for the poor, um, government policy continues to be focused on food-based safety net programs. Um, I recently did a six-week uh, trip through rural India, and, and I drove about 4,000 kilometers. And I visited 20 different uh, villages along the way and did field work in, in those villages. And everywhere we went, we talked about the, the food safety net program, the public distribution system for accessing food grains, etc. And we'd sit down with these uh, groups of women and we'd talk about uh, whether they were getting enough access to these food grains, etc. And we'd ask them, um, you know, as an economist, you'd say, suppose we gave you cash instead of giving you that food, don't you think you'd be better off? And the women would just scream, they'd say, no way, we don't want the cash. And so we'd say, why, say, we can control the food, but we can't control the cash. Once you give us cash, the cash goes away to all kinds of other activities. But if you give us food, food stays in the house and food is used then for feeding the children. So I think there's a real important gender difference when you think about what type of safety net programs work. As an economist, cash-based uh, safety net programs make a lot of sense. But from a gender perspective, it has a very different perspective than an economic perspective. So the next area where I think there's a big role for government policy is uh, behavior change, knowledge transfer, et cetera. Uh, the traditional ex extension systems, we talked about them in this meeting. We talked about how dysfunctional traditional extension systems are. And so there's, a, there's an opportunity now to rethink that process. There's an opportunity to think about how do you build new forms of behavior change? How do you build new mechanisms for transferring information to communities? And I think the top-down approach of the Green Revolution extension systems is extremely outdated. What you need is much more of a community-based system, a community participatory learning uh, system that needs to come into place, where communities can figure out what knowledge they need and figure out where best to get it and experiment with it and then start to use it. And here, the real change happens um, through women and women's organizations. Um, in my field trip through India, what was most amazing was every single village I went to had a very strong women's organization. And many of these women's organizations were first developed as, as microcredit organizations. But they very quickly moved away from microcredit to becoming engines of change and drivers of community change within the community, within the villages. And what NGOs and other development practitioners have figured out is if you get to those women's organizations, you can create change much faster. And so what, what I think we need to do as we think about extension in the future is figure out how one can proactively use rural women's organizations for improving extension work, improving knowledge transfer work within rural communities. And, and ICTs plays a big role here. ICTs can play a big role in transferring messages and lessons learned in one village to other villages. The work that Digital Green is doing in India and in Africa today is one of the most amazing ways in which ICTs are being used uh, for 
improved extension work, improved knowledge transfer work at community level. The last set of comments I want to make is around the breaking of silos um, between agriculture, nutrition, and creating what we all desire, which is an agriculture nutrition nexus. If you look at um, the MDGs, we all talk about the MDGs. But if you put the MDGs against the agriculture nutrition pathway, you find that the MDGs are extremely siloed. And the MDGs don't add up to a whole in terms of improved household level nutrition. And that's, that's a problem when you look at many of the big, broad, global initiatives and global interventions. But if you look at the country level and you look at India, India has multiples of uh, programs going on around agriculture, around nutrition, around water and sanitation, around rural employment, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't want to read out all these acronyms, but that's rural employment, national rural livelihood missions, improved agriculture productivity, improved horticulture, all the way down to improved water and sanitation programs many programs, each program run by a separate ministry, each program funded separately, each program having its own objectives, its own administration, and all of them tripping over each other at a community level. And, and none of them being able to add to one whole of improving nutrition at a, at a household level. So how do you get from these disparate programs at the international level and the, these disparate programs at the national level to mean something more at the community level? So when you think about that, and, and, and I, I realize now that the nutrition community has coalesced around saying, you know, the best way to address stunting is to address the first thousand days of a child. Uh, from conception to the first two years. And I think that makes absolute sense. Then the question that many people come up with is, so what does it mean for agriculture, if you're only talking with the first thousand days? My answer is, if you're interested in the first thousand days, then the crucial person in that chain is the mother and the health of the mother. It's only when you have a healthy mother that you have healthy conception and a healthy birth and then the, a healthy first two years. Now, a healthy mother means that your target population is really all women of childbearing age in the community, all women between 40, 15 to 45 years of age. And the health of that target population depends a lot on agriculture. Not just for food supply, not just for access to food, but also in terms of labor allocation to agriculture, labor allocation to non-agricultural operations, uh, the amount of time spent uh, fetching water, the amount of time spent lifting buckets of water and carrying them, the amount of time spent cooking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a whole set of activities for women in the household that needs to be addressed. And, and in addition to improved access to food, that would be part of what you would need to have in place to get to your goal of the first thousand days. And once we settle on that, then I think at a community level, if we are thinking about convergence across sectoral programs, we need to have a clear idea of what, what our goal is and, and then set measurable progress indicators around that. So the goal could be to reduce child stunting by a certain percentage in a certain number of years. And to do that, it's important to do that at a national level, maybe even at a global level. 
But unless those goals cascade down to the community level in terms of clear, measurable indicators of progress, you won't see ways in which various government interventions can be brought together to work around them. So you need to have a way in which once the community sets these goals, sets clear indicators of progress towards those goals, then figuring out a way in which the various interventions that are there can be brought together in order to address that goal. And finally, you do need fairly transparent monitoring systems in place to make sure that progress is being made and to make sure you identify where all the bottlenecks are. I talked a little bit about women's organizations, but I just wanted to bring that picture back to you. That if you want to make this change happen, look for strong women's organizations at the community level. They, they're going to drive the change. Now, just before I sit down, I want to advertise our new website here. This is the Tata Cornell uh, Agriculture Nutrition Program website. It's coming online. It should be live today. And it has a lot of information and will have a lot more information on the work that we do. Also, we have a very active blog site. It's the Tata Cornell Agriculture Nutrition blog site. And we've got all kinds of people blogging on it. Our latest blog is, will India's new food bill have an impact on undernourished women and children? I invite you to check out our website and our blog and the next time Lawrence does a Google search on the best ag nutrition programs, Cornell will be close to Tufts, if not above it. Thank you so much. <laughs>